أعوذ بالله السلام عليكم الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن وله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت إن شئت تجعل الحزن سهلا اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من أن نشرك بك شيئا نعلمه ونستغفرك بما لا نعلمه ثم أما بعد Inshallah, tonight we will start this journey with um, uh, one of, uh, perhaps one of the um, um, greatest Muslim minds in Islamic history, that is Imam Abu Hamid uh, Al-Ghazali, Abu Hamid Muhammad Al-Ghazali. And as we all know, he wrote so many books, uh, some of them in philosophy, criticizing philosophy, incoherence of philosophers and he also wrote in theology al um, the saver from error and he wrote uh, also in usul al-fiqh not just the fiqh usul al-fiqh two very famous books one is al-mustasfa fi usul al-fiqh al-mustasfa fi usul al-fiqh and the other one uh, is also very famous known as al-mankhul um, and he wrote also um, responding to misguided um, uh, Islamic groups like al Bataniya in particular or the, the Ismailiya, uh, which still exist until today, those who claim that there is Bahir and Batil to Quran, um, uh, there is uh, an apparent meaning and there is hidden meaning. And nobody knows this hidden meaning except one person that is their Imam. Um, so, and he also responded to uh, many other um, uh, philosophers and uh, ideologies. But his, his book, Ahya al-Muddin, stands alone as, as a very valuable book that both scholars and laymen can read and benefit from. Everybody reads Ahya al-Muddin will get um, something, could be different. But um, this book is very famous, has been translated into so many languages. And we'll talk, inshallah, about the context in which he wrote his book and, uh, and the influence of this book. Uh, needless to say that many uh, people did not like Imam Ghazali. Uh, still, many people warn people from reading his books. Uh, many uh, literalists and traditionalists, they believe Al Ghazali was, you know, is like Sufi and therefore um, don't read him because he's not strong in Ilm al Hadith and so on and so forth. But the mass majority of Muslims cannot hear? Yeah, they can come if they want, can, can sit down here, but what's wrong with the speaker system? They can come here, so let's, let's empty this area for, for our sisters who want to come. Did they hear in Jum'ah? Did they pray? Yeah, they prayed. Khalas, alhamdulillah. No, 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 don't, don't mess with this. Khalas. If they want to come, they can come through my office. Brother Nasur, can you open? We'll fix this later, but for now, let them just come in, those who want to come in. Um, his book, Ihya uh, al-Muddin, stands alone as a very uh, important book in Islamic uh, history, in Islamic literature, because Imam al-Ghazali, um, as we will talk about his life briefly today, and uh, the structure of his book, um, he, as, as, as I said, he was like encyclopedia. He, he's a theologian, he's a uh, faqih, he is a philosopher, and he actually not only a philosopher, he criticized the Greek philosophy and people at that time were very much uh, intrigued with the um, uh, Greek philosophy and he wrote a, a book called uh, al al Falasifa, Incoherence of Philosophers and Ibn Rushd in, in Andalusia and this tells you how, um, it tells you about the dynamic of, of um, the intellectual uh, uh, activities in the Muslim community at that time. Ibn Rushd wrote also a very famous book responding to Al-Ghazali's book and he called it The Incoherence of the Incoherence, responding to the incoherence of the philosophy's book, Tahafut at Tahafut. 
So there was this debate about how much of the Greek philosophy you can take and, and, and whether it's working or not. So, but Kitab Ihya Ulum al Din also came in a particular part of Al Ghazali's life when he changed from being a public intellectual and a teacher of philosophy, of usul, and of, of ilm al kalam or Islamic theology into a Sufi. And this actually book is, is a result of, of this shift in his life, which we'll talk about briefly now. Abu Hamad al Ghazali, he was born in the in 10 uh, 50 uh, sorry in in 1058 the 11th century the beginning of the 11th century and he died in 11 11 easy to to know the date of his death 11 11 uh, or 505 hijri all right so the fifth century and he's considered by so many as the mujaddid of the fifth century so uh, there are theories you know rasulullah said that after each uh, after, uh, in, 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 in every century, Allah will send someone to renew um, Islam for Muslims. To, and the word renew or renewal um, is also used with the word ihya, which is revival, and the word reform or islah. If you want, we can talk about this. I don't want to be very uh, academic here, but if you want, or if you are interested, we can talk about it. Renew, Tajdeed, uh, Reform, Islah, and Ihya or Revival are all, uh, they have some common meaning, but they also have uh, subtle differences, which we can talk about later on. Um, his birth was in a, a city called Tuz in Iran. He's Iranian, by the way can say that. Uh, Iranians like always to quote Al Ghazali because he's one of the great Iranian scholars. Um, he was born in Tuz, in, in the uh, in east uh, north of Iran, which today is called Mashhad. It is a very famous city in Iran called Mashhad, very nearby by Tuz. And then he moved to a, another city, not very far from Tuz, called Naisabur, bigger city. And from Naisabur to Baghdad, Baghdad was the, the, the peacon of knowledge at that time. All great minds used to go to Baghdad to seek knowledge, whether you're a linguist, qari, uh, scholar of hadith, scholar of fiqh, uh, philosopher, because Darul Hikmah was established by the Abbasids, Darul al Abbasiyya. Darul Hikmah was, was like Harvard today, you can say that, or Cambridge or Oxford, something big. All big minds come there. Um, and uh, scholars were rewarded tremendously, those who translate any valuable book from any language to Arabic, and those who wrote also good uh, 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 books, they used to be rewarded. Some actually said they weigh the book, um, and then they give them in return the same way in gold. So this is to encourage um, scholars, and, and also not scholars of, of, uh, of Arabic and Quran and Fiqh, but also scholars of chemistry, of astronomy, and, and, and math, and so on and so forth. So all, all big names, that many, many of the big names that we know of came from Baghdad. And now when we say Baghdad, we remember nothing but destruction and um, fanaticism, extremism, um, and big chaos, unfortunately. Baghdad was the best city in the world. Anyone who wants to excel in knowledge, they have to come to Baghdad to be approved by the, their peers, as, as, as all scholars that we know of, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, Imam uh, uh, Abu Hanifa, uh, Imam al-Shafi'i actually spent good time in Baghdad learning there, and Imam al-Juwaini, al-Baqillani, al-Ash'ari, al-Ghazali, all these big names. Of course, when we talk about Arabic grammar, Baghdad, Basra and Kufa are two like, like, uh, like what? Um, you know, Real Madrid and Barcelona, you know, these two teams, you know, right? So this was like a two rivalry, Baghdad, uh, uh, Basra and Kufa, and of course Baghdad was the, the main center. Um, so, and then after that he went to uh, perform Hajj, and then from Hajj to Damascus, and from Damascus back to Baghdad, from Baghdad to Naisabur, back to Tuz, where he died. His father um, had two sons, Muh uh, Abu Hamid, Muhammad al-Ghazali, the older son, and his younger brother, his name is Ahmad al-Ghazali, who is also a very good speaker, uh, and wa'id, 
uh, Khatib. Um, and this man, their father, was a poor person. And he was also Sufi. He likes to go and sit with Sufi scholars and, and so on. And um, he left some money, uh, not very much, uh, not too much money, to one of the Sufi friends he trusts. And he told him, this is what I left for my two sons. So please spend this money on them. Take care of them. He said, OK, I'll do that. And he did, um, took care of these two uh, kids. And he told him before his death, before their father's death, he told them that I regret I did not learn so much. I was like, like not a learned person. So I wish one of both or both of them will be scholars. And I pray all the time that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make them um, uh, scholars who benefit the ummah. Something that also we need to learn, we think of our children, inshallah, as leaders and scholars and people who, who contribute to Islam. This Sufi, uh, after the death of Al-Ghazali's father, took care of these two children uh, until you know, they run out of money. And he told them, you know, that I'm, I'm, I'm also I'm very poor. I cannot take care of you. So I suggest that you go to one of these schools, like madrasas, uh, because people, they donate food and clothes and stuff like this to students. Um, so this is the best way um, uh, for you. So they went to this madrasa and they sit listening, learning how to write and read and memorize some Quran. And they feed them whatever food comes as waqf, you know, the, the concept of waqf or endowment uh, was very common, very common. Uh, there are plenty of waqf, a lot of money. People donate, designated this money for education, for health, and so on. Everybody noticed that Al-Ghazali is different. He's super smart, he has a very sharp mind. He memorizes quickly. His tongue, his Arabic was beautiful. And um, then he went to... Um, uh, Naisabur, and from Naisabur, or in Naisabur, actually he met with um, um, the Suljuk uh, ruler, uh, Nidham al-Mulk. Um, and Nidham al-Mulk also liked scholars, and he used to bring scholars from different backgrounds to talk about tafsir, and Quran, and, and, and theology, and so on. This was also kind of a golden age for, for Islamic theology. Um, Mu'tazilats and Ashaira and, and, and Maturidis and, and so on. So he liked Al-Ghazali very much and Al-Ghazali came to these meetings and he was able to defeat everybody who, who uh, debate with him. He has very good um, uh, you know, tongue, very sharp mind and he always win any debate. So everybody actually recognized him as a great uh, mind. Then, um, then he went, uh, the Zamul Mulk actually um, told him that you need to go to, to Baghdad. You cannot stay for so long here in, in Naisabur. You should go to Baghdad. Let people know who you are. So he sent him to Baghdad. Um, and he taught in, in, in one of the oldest universities, um, exists still, uh, Al Nizamiya, uh, established by the Suljuk Muslims. And of course, everybody liked him. And he was almost the head of this school, Nidamiya, in Baghdad, where again, you have the best minds in theology and fiqh and hadith and so on and so forth. He was teaching there. And so many people actually came to his lecture. And one of them actually said, I came to or listened to Al-Ghazali. There were 400 big turbans. Of all of them are almost scholars, not just regular students. Great scholars, they come and sit and listen to him. His teacher is Imam al Haramain, Imam al Juini, one of the very famous Muslim scholars in Usul and, and Mutakallib also. Um, he's a great mind, he's a, a Shafi'i uh, uh, Imam, Imam al Juini. Anybody who studies Islamic theology or Islamic Usul al Fiqh, he must read uh, some of the writing of uh, al Imam al Juini. Imam al Haramain, his nickname is uh, Imam al Haramain, Imam of the Haramain, Makkah and Medina. Um, so, al Ghazali was one of his students, and he started writing and teaching even in the presence of his teacher, Imam al um, And after the death of his teacher, he became the head of this uh, uh, school. And he kept, as I said, he kept debating um, the different uh, sects and also uh, criticizing um, uh, philosophers. And 
Eventually, he came to see one of um, uh, Sufi Shiu, who was talking or focusing on spirituality and how to purify your heart and how to get closer to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And Imam Ghazali, what what I, I personally like very much about him is that he actually practiced what we call self-criticism, or nafs al-lawama, and he noticed that um, uh, what I'm doing in my life, um, what am I doing in my life? This is like something that we need to do from time to time, take time out and to think about what are we doing in our life. And he said that he's perhaps the most famous scholar of his time, he was young, um, and of course, he got so much money um, from, from the caliph and wazir al-mulk. And people travel to come and see him and talk to him. Um, so he got all this fame and money and closeness from the political authority. But when he talked to this sheikh, who talked to him about ilm al-haqiqah, something we talked about before or when we started the uh, series of fiqh, he said that, what am, am, am I doing? I'm, I'm just teaching. The best thing I do in my life is teaching. But my heart is always attached with money, with fame, with relations. Right? And the best thing I do in my life is teaching. And even this teaching is for not for Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm teaching just to show people how smart I am. Right? And to make money. Okay? So, so we are seeking knowledge and teaching for money and for fame. So then this actually put him in a very uh, severe struggle, internal struggle with himself. He felt that he's not honest, he's not sincere. He's wasting his entire life for nothing. And even this knowledge that he's teaching, he noticed that this kind of knowledge of debating, theological debates and intellectual debates, for, uh, philosophical debates, and even fiqh, how to pray and how to fast, and the, 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 the difference or between madahib and so on. He was Shafi'i, of course. He said these things cannot take us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All these debates, because these debates are not easy. It's sometimes it's very difficult even to read and understand. I started the al Kalam, and, and I, sometimes I, I don't understand many things. Or the, te the, the terminology they're using and so on. This is not, not useful. How would this knowledge and books we write and teaching will get us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? No, none of these books will help me or help the people I teach or those who read my books. That's not going to bring them close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he actually decided to take time out to think about his life and what he is doing. So he said, I was be between the shahawat of this dunya, the desires of this dunya, and the, uh, uh, the hereafter. I think we all go through this. We all go through this. We, we, we wish we can find a way to say, you know what? I have to live this life. I have to work. I have to make some um, living. And at the same time, how we think about how could this um, uh, uh, you know, um, busy schedule help us get closer or do, does not or do not distract us from going to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so he was in this uh, until he um, he said I, I was really um, I reached the point where I have no choice anymore he said one day I went to teach and I could not say anything I could not say anything he said I forgot everything my tongue could not say even one word so he said I was just trying to push myself to go and teach because students come from far away. Say, I was pushing myself to go and teach, but I could not. It's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala locked my tongue so I could not teach. So he said, I, you know, I used to have a choice, but now I have no choice. As if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose for me not to go this way. Um, then he said, I went to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the only one who answered the dua of the stressed person. Um, uh, praying for him and asking him to remove the love of this dunya and remove the love of fame and money from my heart. Then he left Baghdad and it was almost the season of Hajj and he
pretended he's going for Hajj, but his intention was not to go for Hajj. His intention was to withdraw himself and live where nobody knows him. V very good thing. You know, Ghar Hira, Rasulullah used to go by himself, just to think and pray, right? And then Ghazali found out that I need some time out. As we talk about the fitna of, of mal and fitna of, of uh, you know, sexual desire, we talk about the fitna of um, uh, power and authority, they are all fitna, right? The weakness of humans. People like to have more. People like to, to satisfy every desire they have. Fame is one of these very powerful fitna. Sometimes people are, I wish I'm famous. Fame, famous people, they have, they pay very heavy price. Right? Very, very heavy, heavy price. And that includes the ulama, the scholars. And uh, that's why there are plenty of conflicts. And many scholars don't like each other because there's competition. And he talked about this, by the way. Imam Ghazali talked about this. It's, it's a very well-known fact. Who has more students? Who have more people subscribe to his website or watch his TV religious program and so on? I, I know this very well, from very closely. Okay? Who's invited to conferences and so on and so forth. A huge fitness. Huge. That makes people really unable to think properly and not to have the right intention. So he stayed in Damascus for two years, doing nothing, writing no books or reading no books. Just all what he's doing is staying by himself and filling his time with prayer and dua. Um, and purifying himself and trying to take this love of dunya and fame out of his heart. It, it is very um, uh, tempting when, when someone is really highly intellectual. All cameras, all TV stations, all conferences, all universities want him to go and talk, right? And when he goes, you know, the, the auditorium is filled with people. And when he writes a book, the book, the book is, you know, hundreds, if not thousands, of millions of books are sold. It's a huge fitna. Very, very huge fitna. Right? So Imam Ghazali noticed that I'm not doing anything for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm, you know, deceiving myself. I'm deceiving people. That's not for Allah. So he spent two years in Damascus. And you know, in, in the Masjid al-Amawi, uh, in Damascus, um, has a minaret, so he used to go there, there's a room there, and he closes it, and he stays by himself, praying, and making dhikr, reading Quran, and praying Qiyamul Layl, and fasting, and that's what, what is known in, in the Sufi literature as, as mujahada, or riyadah, riyadatun nafs, the word riyadah, which has the meaning of sports, uh, right, but it's a riyadah against yourself, it is mujahada against your own ego, selfishness, bad intentions and so on. How to be in control of yourself and not that uh, yourself is in control over you. So I, I heard this story, I don't know whether it is true or not, but, but Imam Ghazali used to sit there and he, part of his work is to just go and clean the masjid. When nobody is there, he goes and just clean the masjid, just to humble, humili yani, humiliate himself, humble himself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So someone was like, top-notch intellectual Muslim scholar and now he stays where nobody knows him he just go and just think and pray and clean the masjid so we're just waiting for the help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Jam al Amawi in, in, in Dimash so the story goes that he one day he was cleaning the masjid and there were a group of people sitting between prayers and talking about very deep philosophical or, or theological debates between these Madahib, and some issues, very delicate issues that they are talking about it. And they were kind of confused. Uh, this Imam said this, and this school did say that. So they were confused. And you know, Zali Warhi was cleaning, listened to their uh, discussion, and he knows you know, you know, the ins and outs of these things. So he said, you, I, 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 if you don't mind, can I share with you some you know, ideas? 
So, okay, please come in. And he kept talking and talking and talking. And we asked questions and he gave them very deep, specific answers. He said, who are you? Nobody knows these things except Al-Ghazali. And he told him, Allah no Ghazali. But he doesn't want to get involved, but, but, but perhaps he couldn't stop himself from getting into this discussion. So this is something that, that very, very few people um, can do or are willing to do. Uh, because because uh, as Imam al-Busiri said, إِنَّ الطَّعَامَ يُقَوِّ شَهْوَةَ النَّهِمِ Imam al-Busiri in his Burda said a uh, beautiful verse at the beginning of his uh, poetry when he said, فَلَا تَرُمْ بِالْمَعَاصِ قَصْرَ شَهْوَتِهَا إِنَّ الطَّعَامَ يُقَوِّ شَهْوَةَ النَّهِمِ Don't seek to satisfy yourself by giving her what she wants. Because the more you eat, the more you like to eat more. Right? Your nafs is like a baby. If you don't wean the baby, then you will grow up asking for nursing. But if you wean him or her, they will stop. That is, that's like your nafs is like this. Right? Have you seen a four or five years old child you know, getting milk from his mother? Well, see, some, some women could not you know, wean their children because it's so soft and they could not do this. But every mother at a certain point, no. She has to say no. And the baby cries and cries and cries. They let them cry. So now Busiri said the nafs is, is like this. If you give her what she wants, she will demand more and more and more. So don't think that when you give your nafs what she wants, it's really, oh, thank you, that's enough. She will ask for more. So we say, no, I have to wean you. Fitan. So then he went to Mecca and Medina for Hajj, and then he went back to Baghdad after 11 years. He spent 11 years out of Baghdad. And in, this, in these 11 years, we spent some of them in, in Damascus, Mecca, Medina, Alexandria, uh, Jerusalem, and he made the Itikaf also in Masjid al-Aqsa, Qubbat al-Sahra and uh, back to Baghdad. In these 11 years, he wrote Kitab Ihya' al which we'll discuss in some details, inshallah. Then from Baghdad, he went back to Naisabur, from Naisabur to Tuz. He said, you know what? I want to stay in this small village, Tuz, that he, where he was born, and not teaching, just busy with ibadah, and dhikr, and so on. And, and uh, they heard about him coming back, so they begged him to come to back to Naisabur to teach. Um, and he went, you know, he was forced or pressured to go back. And uh, Nidamul Mulk uh, uh, was killed. And then he went back to Tuz. Um, and he built a small school next to his house, and for Sufis also, for Sufi people. And. Um, and he spent his time between reading Quran, making dhikr, teaching some students in this small school he built, and reading Al-Bukhari al-Muslim in particular. One of the things that Bukhari, uh, Imam al-Ghazali was not uh, expert in is Ilm al-Hadith. Right? Um, if he wanted, he could have been one of the best, but he was busy with other uh, studies. Um, so he, in the end of his life, he said, I need to read and study Al-Bukhari and, and Muslim. Mm -hmm. and they, people, many people saw a huge difference between Al-Ghazali, you know, 11, 14 years ago, and Al-Ghazali now. He used to be very wealthy, wearing very expensive clothes, and, and uh, he said, we, in Baghdad, um, we just calculated how much his right and his shoes and his clothes and amama and so on, it was almost 500 dinar, huge amount of money. And then when he came back uh, to Baghdad, we looked at his belongings and it was on, 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 only 15, only 15. Mm -hmm. Mamal Ghazali, um, spent the rest of his life in Tuz, again, uh, uh, spending his time in reading Quran, Hadith, 
Qiyam, Siyam, and, and so on. Um, he has a few girls, uh, he did not leave uh, sons, and um, one day uh, after his uh, Fajr prayer, uh, he prayed and then he said, uh, bring my kafan to me. And then he looked at this kafan and kissed it and put it on his eyes and he said, Samirna wa'ata'na. We listen and we obey. Um, then he spread his, uh, uh, his legs and then he faced the Qibla uh, and he died um, before the sunrise. Some of his uh, followers came to him when he was before his death and they said, give us an advice. This great scholar, great, big, big mind, he gave one word, just one word, give us an advice. Do you know what he said? He said just one word. He said, alayka bil ikhlas, alayka bil ikhlas, alayka bil ikhlas. That's, that's the, the, the cream of his experience and knowledge, sincerity. So be sincere in anything you do. That's, that's the, 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 the summary of his experience and knowledge. If you have ikhlas, if you're sincere, that's it. No matter how much you pray or fast, do what you do, but be sincere. And of course, we can, we can tell that he was not sincere and he became sincere, but this took a lot of years of ibadah and jihad, we call it jihad al-akbar, or the uh, bigger or major jihad that Rasulullah sallallahu talked about, jihad against ourselves. So, so it was not easy, but he did it. And when he was asked before his death about what kind of advice he wanted to give us, it's ikhlas, he kept repeating it until he died. Uh, his qabr uh, used to be known, but n now nobody knows exactly where is his, uh, his, uh, his grave. Um, I, I will stop with this uh, 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 you know, uh, talk about his uh, uh, life. And now let's talk about his book, Hiya Ulum al-Din. Uh, again, he, was, he wrote this book uh, when he changed his uh, vision and philosophy in life. And uh, he noticed that at that time, fuqaha and madahib used to fight with each other, debate with each other, disagree with each other, and everybody think his madhab is better. And they talk about very fine details about fiqh and salah and tahara and wudu and, and, and so on and so forth. And if you read any comparative fiqh, uh, any book in comparative fiqh, you can see this. And people are very fanatic because these imams, um, uh, Imam Malik, uh, Abu Hanifa, and Ahmad, and Shafi'i, were very close to each other in the third century, third and fourth uh, century. He came in the fifth century. Um, and he was Shafi'i, but he noticed that, you know, that that's not the knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us um, uh, to, to focus on. And he considered fiqh actually one of the uloom of this dunya, not the uloom of the akhir. He said, like, you need accountant, you go to accountant, right? You need a lawyer, you go to a lawyer. You uh, need to know about the law, go to someone who studied the law, who is a faqih or imam or mufti. That's it. He said, perhaps except salah and, 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 and hajj. That's it. He said, when you go for hajj, you need, at that time, they need guards. When you, people travel, they need guards, like people to protect them in case. So he said, this guard is not going for hajj, he's just going to protect you and take money. Right? So fiqh does not necessarily bring you closer to Allah. And if we think about it, when we talk about Salah, Imam Ghazali himself wrote in his book, al munqiz bin al-Dalal, he said, people focus so much on the harakat, how, what to do with your hand, and how to make rukur, what to say, and whether to say ameen loudly or not, and whether to make kunut before rukur or after rukur, how many raka'ah of taraweeh, all these things, so what? I mean, Someone is right and others are wrong. How would this help us get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? 
If, said, if Khushur is missing, there's no point to waste your time to memorize books or write books in which Madhab is better. Right? And he said, this is what's missing. This is what is missing. And he said, I'm going to focus on this. And that's why Kitab Ihya Al-Muddin actually is, is, is doing both. He talked about fiqh, as we will discuss now. But he talked about asrar, asrar, the floor of sirr or secret. The secrets of prayer, the secrets of zakat, the secrets of fasting, the secrets of hajj. He, secrets, he does not refer to a secret as we understand it, but he's talking about the wisdom, the, the act of the heart, not the act of the body. When you make wudu, what should you have in your heart, in your mind? Other than, you know, the fiqh aspect. Because wudu should be very simple, very simple. Just wash your hands, your head, arms to the elbow, and wipe the hair and your feet. That's it. Easy and simple. Very easy. I remember when I was studying the Shafi'i Madhab when I was young, uh, we were studying Tahara, and then we started Salah. I remember very well when the Shaykh was teaching us Matn Abi Shuja', one of the uh, mutun, the small uh, explanation of Imam Shafi'i Madhab. And he said, Takbirat al-Ihram, the first part, Takbirat al-Ihram, Allahu Akbar, just to begin your prayer. Are 16 conditions for Takbirat al-Ihram to be correct. I said, my God, 16 things you have to observe when you, when you, make, when you just say Allahu Akbar. So, well, what is this? Where did this all details from? Uh, if you do this, then the Takbirat al-Ihram is batil, and therefore the whole prayer is batil. And you forgot to say it, or if you made this word uh, prolong this vowel uh, or shorten it, then the meaning will change and the whole prayer. Well, what is this? Just, just say Allah Akbar. Rasulullah did not teach people fiqh like this. Wudu, and, uh, wudu was mentioned in, in, in two lines in the Quran. Right? That's it. And, and he found out that people are making things very much complicated, and in addition, it's not going to help. If someone prays perf perfectly fine from fiqh perspective, but his prayer has no kushur, and th this salah did not bring him closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you lost the point. You missed the point. So, so he said, we have to reconcile these two things. Fiqh, which is the act of the body, and tasawwuf, or tazkiyah, um, which is the act of the heart. That's why we always see people talking about sharia and haqiqa. So the word sharia and the word haqiqa. As if they are two different things. Sharia focuses on laws. This is what you have to do. This is how many times you have to pray. This is how, many, how much money you have to spend for zakah and so on. All these details is the uloom of sharia. But the uloom of haqiqa. Why you are doing this? What are the objectives? And how can this salah takes us closer to Allah subhanahu How would this salat change our akhlaq? Right? Fiqh does not address these things. You will not, never find a faqih who writes a book of fiqh and writes about the impact of prayer on our um, spirit, and our heart, and our um, uh, uh, spirituality, on our akhlaq. That's not the job of fiqh. And people went so far in this direction and forgot totally about the haqiqah. And to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What about tawakkul? Reliance on Allah. What is tawakkul? What is the haqiqah of tawakkul? And how to be a good mutawakkil ala Allah? Allah said, tawakkal ala Allah, right? Wa ala Allah tawakkalu. What is tawakkul? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, yuhibbuhum wa yuhibbuna. Allah loves them and they love Allah. So what, what is the definition of love of Allah? And how do we know Allah loves us? And when we love Allah subhanahu what should we do to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And what will happen when we love Allah? And how much we love Allah? How can we measure our love to Allah? All these things are not addressed. That's not important. Only some people who call themselves Sufis who focus on this haqiqah. Not to ignore Sharia, but that, that, for them that is Islam. That is Islam. How to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How to develop a personal relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Repentance. What is repentance? What are the conditions of repentance? What should you feel when you repent? And how do you know if repentance is accepted? Um, and uh, patience. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about patience and, and praised those who are patient. What is patience? And what kind of patience? And when patience is, is, is 
is not, it's not a, 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 a merit, but it is uh, actually unethical. Anger. What's anger? When anger is good and when anger is bad. And how to control it. And what kind of heart disease that we, 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 we may have. And he talked about all these things in, in his book. So, so Sufis, this, this conflict is, is, is not supposed to take place. Because Islam starts with Rasulullah who actually talked about three levels. Very famous hadith in Jibreel السلام, came and the Sahaba looked and found very handsome person, nice clothes and, 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 um, and uh, black hair and, and fair skin. Nobody knows him. And he does not look like a traveler. He came and asked the Prophet, what's, what is Islam? I told him five pillars. What is Iman? Six articles of faith. Jesus, Allah, his angels, the day of judgment, prophets, and revelation, and Qadr. And then he said, what's Ihsan? What is Ihsan? And he, he said, Ihsan is to worship Allah as if you see him. You don't see him, know that he sees you. So, you can replace the word Tasawwuf with the word Ihsan. What's Ihsan? Ihsan is all these things we talk about. How to purify your heart from disease. How to uh, improve your akhlaq. How to be more peaceful with yourself and with those who are around you. How to forgive. How to cleanse your heart from arrogance, from showing off, from attachment to this dunya. To fill your heart with the love of Allah subhanahu If you want to call it tasawwuf, fine. If you want to call it ihsan, the, the, the level of ihsan, that's ihsan. If you want to call it tazkiyah, tazkiyah is, is a Quranic term. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا Right? So tazkiyah in nafs is to purify yourself and to push yourself to do the right thing and to stay away from the wrong thing. That is not, that's missing. Imam Ghazali said, what am I doing? I'm coming from this high class of intellectuals. That's all for, for dunya. It's all for dunya. Now it's time to focus on the akhirah. So, one of the reasons why he wrote Kitab Ihya Ulum Deen, you can tell from the name of the book, the Revival of the Science of Religion. All these signs of religion should actually complement one another, not to contradict with one another. I remember also when I was young, every time I read a book in fiqh or in Arabic grammar or tafsir or hadith, usually the writers write, and this is one of the most noble signs because so and so. Tafsir. Oh, Tafsir is the best sign because uh, sign, one of the best signs in Islam because through which you know, you know, understand the message of Allah. Subhanahu wa Therefore, nothing is more noble than this. Those who write in Arabic grammar say, okay, Arabic grammar is, is the most noble sign because Quran is Arabic and Hadith is Arabic, and if you don't know Arabic, you will not be able to understand the word of Allah. And then the scholars of Hadith, oh, this is the most noble Hadith uh, sign because through which you know the Sunnah of the Prophet, which interpret the Quran, and so on. Akhlaq, the science of Akhlaq. They say the same thing, because Quran and the Sharia came to affirm the makarim al-akhlaq. Rasulullah said that, I have been sent only to affirm the good characters. So everything in Islam should lead to good character. So Akhlaq is the best sign. And theology, of course, Theologians, they say, oh, Aqidah. Aqidah is the most important thing. If Aqidah is, is, is not sound, nothing will help you. So you have to have a sound Aqidah first, and then you can read Hadith and Tafsir and so on. I personally noticed that. Why, why, why do you have to, which one is the best? It doesn't matter. We will all complement. We need all of them together because all of them came from the same source. So we need Arabic, we need uh, uh, Quran, we need Tafsir, we need Arabic language, we need Hadith, we need science, uh, Aqidah, we need all these things. But at that time, the separation between science was very problematic and still problematic. I actually argue this in my thesis. Especially when it comes to law and ethics. Separation between law and ethics is very problematic in Islamic law. When something that's unethical but still legal. I don't want to go deep in this, but, but there are plenty of cases when, when fuqaha say, yeah, that's from fiqh, but it's legal. 
It's unethical, yeah, it's unethical, but still legal. And this separation between two branches of Sharia, by the way, the word Sharia includes all these things. And uh, this separation between Sharia and Hatita, I, 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 I doubt it's accurate. Because Sharia includes Hatita. But this separation between theology, ethics, law, uh, hadith, and so on, it made new or produced new community of intellectuals. We call them ulama. Right? So ulama, some of them is specialized in hadith. He's not a faqih, he's not a, a scholar of tafsir, Quran. His entire life spent in knowing the chain of narration and, and different narration of hadith. Like Imam Bukhari and Muslim and Tirmidhi and so on. Some of them were both faqih and muhaddith, but not, not very much. And some actually specialize in theology, Islamic theology, especially when they interact with Jews and Christians and non, non believers. And so Muslims have to use the Greek philosophy to respond to these uh, theologies. Where is tasawwuf here? Where is tazkiyah? Where is ihsan? It's, it's kind of missing. And the best way is to bring all these things together because they complement each other. In fact, you can find most of the will recognized and renowned Sufis, also Fuqaha. Mawr Junaid, who is one of one, one, big names in, in Islamic Sufism, and he says that anything we say or we do that's not coming from the Quran and Sunnah, ignore it. If I told you anything that's not coming from the Sunnah, just ignore it. So there's no conflict between Sharia and Haqiqah. There's no conflict between them because, again, they are coming from the same source. Allah told us to pray, and he also told us to have khushu'a in the prayer. So there's no com conflict, speciality in, in, in fiqh and other in, in, in khushu'a, no. Rasulullah Sallallahu was not teaching two separate science. So Imam al-Ghazali came actually to contribute this when he found out that this separation is not good. We have to know how to pray, but we also we need to know why we are praying. What does Allah Sallallahu Alaihi expect from us when we pray? Right? We need to fast and know the rules, fiqh, but we also, more important, is to know what are the objectives of fasting. Why Allah wants, and what kind of, of feeling or thoughts we should have when we fast. So he wrote this book to, an, as an attempt to reconcile all these signs. And very quickly, this book consists of four uh, main chapters. The first um, chapter here is called Rubra. Rubra means quarter. He called it Rubra al Ibadat. The first quarter, he called it Rubra al Ibadat, acts of worship. And again, he talked about this, all these acts of worship Tahara, Salah, Siyam, Zakah, and Hajj. But again, he, he talked not only about the law, but he also talked about the spiritual and ethical benefits of, of, of these things, right? In the second quarter, it talks about the daily life, the norms, the, the, our eating and drinking, and getting married and working and business, all these things, again, from Islamic perspective, from, from Sufi perspective, from um, um, uh, ethical perspective. And the third quarter, in the third quarter, he talked about something, he called it al-muhlikat. Muhlikat. What's muhlikat? The destructive, the destructive things, the things that, that des destroys people. In which he talked about the disease of the heart in detail, envy, and, and arrogance, and hatred, and, and all these kind of things in, in, in amazing detail. Then he talked about the lisan, tongue. He talked so much about afat al lisan, afat al lisan, the illnesses of, of the tongue. He talked about lying, about backbiting, about cursing, about uh, hypocrisy. He talked about. Uh, um, uh, giving false testimony and so on and so forth and uh, uh, just amazing when I was reading this when I was young in high school I was really surprised well, what, what, what's going on that most of us are misusing our tongue when you read this book actually it's like a mirror you're looking in the mirror it tells you exactly what happens and just to give you an example of, of things that, that really makes us um, uh, aware of things that we don't pay attention to when he talked about showing off, 
It turns about different levels of showing off, right? And what if Allah, if someone does something for Allah and then he likes that people are seeing him? So he's doing it for Allah and for the people as well. Uh, what, what, would Allah accept this? Would this be good? Would, would he be rewarded only for the portion in which he has sincere intention or, and not, or the whole thing will be rejected? What will happen? And he talked about the fact that sometimes people, shaitan comes to them to turn their intention, to make it for the people, in very subtle ways that many people don't pay attention to. And he said, for example, someone who may be a scholar or an imam or a da'i or that's someone that people look at him. And then when he prays and see people, he say, you know what, these people are learning from me, so I will perfect my prayer so that they can learn something that maybe not find in the book. So he perfect his prayer more just with the intention of teaching them, but that's not the false intention. The intention is to show off. And he, and sometimes he mentioned something that I, I found also uh, interesting when he said that sometimes scholars speak and in the beginning of their speech they say I'm nothing I'm just a student of knowledge um, uh, you know he tries to humble himself very um, badly and he said that's that, that he said this is the essence of arrogance to some no, not to everybody who says that I'm not saying that but he said that this could be the essence of arrogance because he's saying that because he expects people to like what he says. Right? Again, I'm not saying those who say that are, are, have bad intention, but Imam al-Ghazali said sometimes people do that. He was one of them. And he actually just, he kind of, you know the open heart surgery? When you read al-Ghazali, it's like he's opening the heart and pointing to the kind of different kind of disease that can be there. And he tells you what you need to do to clean your heart from this. It's just amazing. When he, he's like a psychologist. He knows exactly what goes on in the heart and the mind of people and what motivates people to act in a certain way and, and how to overcome this. So he talked in the third quarter about the muhlikat and then in the fourth and last quarter he talked about al-munjiyat. What's al-munjiyat? Coming from the word najat. Exactly. Right? So we talked about way um, uh, to salvation, if you want. What saves you. So he talked about what, destruct, what may destruct you. And then in the last one, he talked about what may save you. And of course, the last part you can imagine. Plenty of very nice prescriptions. Very, very nice prescriptions. When you talk about tawbah and sabr and, and hub and shawq ilallah and mujahada. And nafs and punishing yourself and he talked about uh, so many other qiyamul layl and how to you know uh, train yourself to pray qiyamul layl and so on and so forth so how many quarters there four which well, first one is ibadat right and the second the daily living norms right we call it al-adat by the way the word adat adat you know the word adat huh the habits, the, the custom, you know, customary things, uh, you know, tradition. You know, when people um, uh, get married and do business and so on, uh, eating. And he talked about the adab of eating, adab of getting married, and, and, and so on and so forth. And the last one, oh, sorry, the third one is al al muhlikat, and the last one is al munjia. So ibadat, adat. Muhlikat, munjiyat. Muhlikat, munjiyat is the opposite of muhlikat. Right? Huh? Exactly. It looks like his own experience. These are the ibadat. But he addressed it from both perspectives. Ethical, spiritual, and legal. It's Shafi'i. So he, he introduced, I mean, he explained according to Shafi'i. We don't have to uh, just... Uh, uh, but, but what's important is the asrar. The... the, the, the the meanings of wudu and meanings of, of hajj and so on. Um, so, ibadat, adat, muhlikat, and munjiyat. So, inshallah, we'll, uh, we'll choose. We cannot cover everything, otherwise, we'll do it so much. But we will choose from each of these uh, quarters what uh, may benefit us 
Imam Ghazali's book has been translated. Uh, some translations are not very good, um, and uh, some are good. There's a website called ghazali.org. Ghazali, or al-ghazali.org, I think. It is uh, ghazali.org. G-H-A-Z-I-L dot com. Where, in which they, I think it was an American uh, scholar who actually spent his entire life translating al-ghazali's work. Um, so uh, you can find Hayarumuddin free in English uh, and, and Arabic, of course. And I don't know if it translated to Urdu. I'm not sure. You can find out and let me know. I will stop here, inshallah. And um, inshallah, next week we'll start talking about these asrar, or the meanings of the ibadat. We'll take from the first quarter a um, uh, few weeks, and then inshallah go back to the second quarter and third and fourth, inshallah. Questions or comments? Yes. About the Greek philosophy. Okay. All right. So, Imam al Ghazali's point was that Islamic theology, you cannot apply. The, uh, philosophy, the Greek philosophy methodology on Islamic theology because we have one source of knowledge that's the Quran and the, and the Sunnah of the Prophet so, so uh, you cannot subject Sharia to man-made methodology and uh, you can tell at that time um, again a lot of philosophers and schools of thoughts and so on and Muslims found themselves in a position when they have to defend Islamic theology through rational philosophical methodology. In the time of the Prophet ﷺ, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ar-Rahman wa Arsh istawa, Ar-Rahman subhanahu wa ta'ala, ala al-Arsh, on the throne, established himself. Istawa, istawa. This is like istawa, settled. Ar-Rahman wa Arsh istawa, Ar-Rahman Arsh istawa. That's it. How big is the arsh and, and how Allah sits on it? We don't know. The, they never asked the Prophet and the Prophet never explained. Because there's no need. We are believers. And they were the best generation. There was no need to go and ask. Never anybody asked the Prophet وسلم, how did Allah settle on his throne? We didn't know how Allah looked like, and then we didn't know. But, but he, we believe, he established himself on the throne. Now, when you have Christians who believe God himself came in the form of a man, and he you know, was born, and, and, and then he lived a normal life, and then he was crucified, and you can't, people saw God and talked to him and touched him and so on. So, you, you see, so and, and those who disbelieve in, 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 in God I'll believe that like this evolution thing. It is, it's nature. So Muslims have to speak about, no, God exists, logically. And I, I shared this story with you before when Imam al-Razi, uh, again, one of the great uh, minds in Islam. Imam al-Razi, uh, he came to Naysabur. And people were coming out, hundreds. Everybody came to listen to Imam al-Razi. Big name superstar in Islamic theology and philosophy. And this lady, an uh, old Muslim lady, she was just looking at people, what, what's going on? I said, a Razi is coming. She said, who are Razi? Who is a Razi? She said, you don't know a Razi? She said, no, I've never heard about him. What, 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 what did he do? She said, they told her that he wrote 100 dalil, rational evidence that Allah exists. I said, really? Then he had 100 doubts. Do we really need to find the leel that Allah exists? Well, it's nonsense. He left that. And after 40 years of debating and writing and studying about the qadr, about the existence of Allah and about the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Imam Razi himself said in the end of his life, I wish I will die with the same aqidah and faith like these old ladies. It did not help. I regret I spent my life searching on this area. The best way is the Quranic way. So Imam Ghazali actually 
said, we don't need this. And in addition, he tried to prove that it's not going to lead you to the truth. So uh, that, that, that's why he saw this, this contradiction between the methodology of, of especially in faith, the Greek, Greek um, uh, philosophy and, and, uh, and Islam. Yes? This, this point actually has been raised. Uh, what, what time is Adan today? An Iqama? Huh? In five minutes? Well, the Imam can delay it for another ten minutes. <laughs> oh. Okay, this is a very good point. Very good point because actually this is the, 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 the criticism to some uh, uh, Sufi uh, uh, trends um, or tariqas that they are pacifists. Tasawwuf or tazkiyah does not at all mean to be passive. In fact, Imam Ghazali himself was very harsh in criticizing those who were in power. Very harsh. And he told them, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People are hungry because of your greed and, and so on. There are plenty of letters he wrote to these people. Yes, yes. So, so, Sufism does not mean pacifism. Just to stay alone and isolate yourself from society. And as, as, as he said, it's true. Many corrupt um, uh, rulers, they really like to see people passive, staying home, not involved in dunya. And I've seen this in places like Egypt. When these, I don't want to say bad words in the masjid. Um, I think I can say idiots. Right? They say, okay, because the price of everything is going high. And very poor people cannot find anything to eat. Oh, your rizq will come to you. Allah, if Allah wants to give you something, it will come to you. Don't worry. Just have faith in Allah and Allah will provide for you. What are you talking about? You are talking to the poor people to ask them to be patient. You are not talking to the corrupt leaders who are sucking the blood of these people. I agree. Uh, but that's not Sufism. That's, that's, that's something else. And he was writing, start writing. It's not passive. Actually, writing this book is not pacifism. He used his knowledge to educate others. All right? Yes? So you have to define the word metaphysics because in philosophy, metaphysics can be understood in, in many different or, or, or defined in many different ways. Um, if we are talking about metaphysics as we understand it from the Islamic perspective, is iman bil ghayb, aladina bil ghayb, and Allah is ghayb, alim al ghayb wa shahada, right? So metaphysics. Um, if you mean that the connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, believe in Allah, pray to him, ask him for guidance, expect Allah to give you some guidance and light and, and, and protection and, and so on. Um, yes, because he understood Islam as, as a comprehensive uh, 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 system. It's not, it's not, you cannot just pick and choose. He saw imbalance in how people understand Islam. Like all other reformists, 
What makes a reformist, a reformist is that he sees something wrong, right? And he found a huge gap between Sharia and the fruits of Sharia, the result of Sharia, the law and the, and the goals, objectives of the law. So, so uh, that's why he tried to fill this gap. And he actually started by himself because he was looking for his own salvation and to also educate others and to close this gap between Sufis and Fuqaha and, and, and theologians. So I think he did a very good job and I think we very much need to um, look at our practice, what we are doing in our life, and then we make some adjustment. This is what we're trying inshallah, to do when we... Huh? He's Sufi, he's a theologian, he's a faqih, he's a philosopher, he's all these together. Yes. But again, as I said, the word Sufi, if you want to replace it with the word Tazkiyah, with the word Ihsan, um, uh, Akhlaq, but we use the word Sufi because it's very famous. But I also agree, Sufism has, many people went so far. Uh, you have extremism in every, everywhere. The Fuqaha also have like very extreme ideas about fiqh and law and so on. Um, so we're not talking about the extreme people. We're talking about mainstream Sufis. They, the Fuqaha need them and they need the Fuqaha. Yes? No, no, no. Sufism, you can say that Sufism started early on in the time of the Prophet because the Prophet was teaching his Sahaba. Remember the job of the Prophet is, as the Quran says, يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ So tazkiyah and kitab and hikmah, fiqh, aqidah, all these things, they are one thing. The Prophet is doing that. No, I mean, the, the word Sufi and Tasawwuf, nobody knows exactly when it, it, it emerged and what does it mean. But um, it, is, it is a technical, technical term that has been used to describe those who focus on, on Tazkiyah or Ihsan, aspect of Islam. And also, as many uh, uh, historians noticed that also the Tasawwuf as tariqas uh, uh, and trends or groups or movements actually came as a reaction to the extreme materialism of the Umayyads. The Umayyads, they became kings and they built big palaces and beautiful mosques and they have their own, you know, uh, and, and, and those who are wealthy people, they, they live this kind of very extravagant life. And many people say, no, 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 that's not, that's not Islam. That's not how Rasulullah and Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman, well, these people live their life. These people are dunya people. So let's go back to um, spirituality and focus on it. So this also added to the emergence of the organized Sufi uh, tariqas. And Imam Ghazali was influenced by this, but started very early on. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdika nashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa natubu alayk. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون سلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين الله أكبر الله أكبر Allahu Akbar, Allah.